Well, ladies and gentlemen, I could tell you all loved Rocket Man, right? Thank you so much for being here at today's very special screen for the SAG After Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Taryn Edgerton. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a lovely welcome. This is cozy. This is nice. Cozy, nice, intimate, and very, very passionate here at the foundation. So thank you so much for being here. Hey, you kidding me? Thank you for having me. You know, we, we, were, we, we were talking uh, but before about how, you know, when the movie opened in May and through the summer, you know, you've been talking about the film quite a bit. Yeah. And now that, uh, you know, you've, you've started talking about it again, uh, what kind of perspective do you have sort of looking back on, on the journey that you had over the summer, you know, debuting it in Cannes, like how proud are you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it's one of those lovely things where, you know, quite often the folly of youth, you see you, things happen and they're really great in your life and you don't appreciate them while they're happening. But every minute of the journey of Rocketman, I just knew how lucky I was and how much of a joy it was to work with the people who worked on the film, to have this incredible privilege of portraying someone that I, you know, I've admired since childhood and um, now very weirdly counted amongst my friends. Um, but uh, you guys text each other. He's not a big texter. He calls me. He, call <laughs> uh, he likes email, but he calls me a lot. And I always know it's him because it comes up with a withheld number. Um, and he always affects a very broad Cockney accent at the start of the conversation. I don't know why. So I go, hello. And I say, I oh, don't really know why. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, you know, I just think of, you know, those months earlier in the year of, of promoting the movie and before that making it. It's just been a joy. I mean, you know, it's hard work, obviously. But, um, and it's, you know, it deals with some, some you know, it ain't singing in the rain all the time, you know what I mean? But, uh, but, it, uh, but it's, um, yeah, it's been an amazing, a wonderful episode in my life. You know, I, when, I, when you look back on your life, you know, there were so many moments where, where Elton John and his music had a part in your life mm. where it almost feels like this was so meant to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose in some respects, what are you knitting? No, I'm genuinely interested. I'm always fascinated by people who do that. No, it's lovely. I feel it's super cozy in here, isn't it? <laughs> Gorgeous. Good for you. Um, no, don't put it away. I just love it. I'm just enjoying it. Um, but um, uh, uh, I've forgotten what you asked me. Sorry. Oh, good. Uh, uh, this was meant to be. Yeah, yes, of course. I mean, in some respects, I think for all of us, Elton John is one of those artists, you know, like, I don't know, the Beatles and you know he, it, people feel a sense of ownership over the music because they're there soundtracking important moments in our lives you know people have their first dances at their wedding to these songs you know it's so I think in some respects you know anyone could have felt that way but um, <laughs> but I suppose there were a few instances you know when my mother and my stepfather first got together when I was about 13, there'd been a Greatest Hits album that recently came out, an Elton John Greatest Hits album, and my stepfather and I spent a lot of time listening to music together, and we'd, put, we'd always skip to, I guess that's why they call it the blues, on his, on the CD, the CD player in his Ford Mondeo as he drove me to school, and we would sing it together, and, yeah. you know, and I remember very, very, very um, vividly The Lion King coming out and watching him in that white suit in the woods, you know, <laughs> sort of... Yeah, and yeah. going, who's that guy, you know? And and then w when it gets a little more weird is where, you know, I, my audition piece for drama school was your song. Um, and also then, you know, I ended up singing I'm Still Standing in Sing and uh -huh, uh -huh. Elton cameoed in the second Kingsman film. And so, yeah, there's been lots of little kind of incremental weird moments of, I don't know, if you were to be grand about it, you would say the universe bringing us together. Yeah, I'm totally, sure I was yeah. more aware of it than he was. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he, I'm sure he definitely thought, wow, the universe has brought me, brought me to. With this young, to unknown Welsh guy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but looking back at, at Kingsman, uh, yeah. you know, the, like how did that cameo of Elton John in that film lead to this? I think, um, um, Elton had been asked to be in the first Kingsman film and had declined. 
and then he saw it and really loved it. Um, and so came along to do the second one. And basically, Matthew Vaughan, who directed those movies and produced this one, um, and David Furnish, who produced this one, and Elton, but kind of all hit it off, really. And Matthew knew that I was was quite interested in trying to find a, a part in a, in a musical theatre project. And, um, and Matthew's always been really good at kind of making suggestions and providing opportunities for me that are a little bit outside the box. You know, nothing about playing Eggsy and Kingsman would suggest that I would be the right guy to play Eddie the Eagle, and nothing about me playing Eddie the Eagle would be sort of particularly appropriate to suggest I should play Elton John, but Matthew, to his credit, has always been quite outside of the box in terms of casting opportunities for me. And so I think he first suggested it to me in 2016, and I was sort of, you know, I'll check my diary. <laughs> um, uh, obviously, super excited at the prospect of doing it. Um, and then, yeah, I, and then I basically started seeing a bit of Elton occasionally. And and, and uh, he was sent some stuff of me singing and um, was seemed to like it and sort of got into the idea of me playing him as well. And David too. And... Yeah, and then, you know, Dexter came on board and that just felt like a, the perfect project for me because Dexter is, you know, has become family to me. You know, we've, we've, we've been friends for a few years now, made two films together. And, um, yeah, and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. But you're taking on something like playing Elton John and you're singing and you're, you're dancing and obviously you're, you're performing, you're acting, you're doing all of it. How does the comfort of working with a director that you've already worked with, in this case, Dexter Fletcher from Eddie the Eagle, how does that comfort level give you a comfort to elevate your performance? I think it definitely helps, for sure. I mean, and also, I don't know if any of you have, are aware of Dexter and the kind of personality he is, but um, if you're at all interested, go on YouTube, some interviews with him. He's great fun, and he's a very warm person, and he's very... Uh, emotionally available and and very just a really good all-round good guy as well as a brilliant creative and I f feel like we complement each other quite well creatively I feel like I do good work when I'm working with him um, and yeah I yeah he's excited about me as an actor and he lets me know and I I'm a, I'm kind of I thrive on positive <laughs> information I think so um, positivity is a good thing positivity is a good thing yeah. yeah so we work well together and um, we joke now, we need to find the sort of third part in our trilogy of bespectacled <laughs> red-haired yeah. men. But, um, yeah. yeah. So, when you're, you're prepping to play Elton John, how, like, like he's an icon, he's a legend. Yeah. So, what, is your, what are your points of connection to engage and perform and play Elton John? Um, well, you're all actors, right? So, you know, I, I think, for my part, I always felt that there's, a, there's, uh, you know, there's that phrase, isn't there, that the, the king doesn't play the king, the court plays the king. And actually to try and play the king, to play some elevated, grandiose, regal person is probably, a, is probably not how a king would behave. It's almost the behaviour of the people around the king mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that conditions your perception of it. Because the king does what the fuck he wants. <laughs> so I sort of felt that with someone like Elton, you know, you just play, you play him for his humanity. And our movie's all about celebrating the humanity of him and in all his gorgeous flaws. You've just sat through the movie, he's not perfect, <laughs> you know. Um, and he doesn't pretend to be. So that's what always really excited me about this project was that it is a kind of warts and all, it's still a celebration. It's still, you know, th at the end of the movie, you're still hopefully completely behind him and you haven't decided that you don't like him because he doesn't always behave perfectly. But, um, yeah, what did I do? I don't really know what I did. <laughs> I, I, I just, I was very passionate about it and I felt partly through my friendship with him and partly because it's a great script, I felt very emotionally invested in it and I felt like through becoming his friend and us growing to care about one another, it all of a sudden just made it feel very real and important. So the moment, by the time we came on set, it all felt very, it felt natural. I felt what he feels quite acutely, more than I have anything else, I think. Um, why that is, I don't know. And also, th there's something about music, I think. There's something about the music and it be making it feel very, music makes you 
uh, emotionally available, I think. That music is very personal too. Absolutely, yeah. You know, the, the other thing is you're playing someone who has been so, so documented, not just in his musical performances, in his music videos, in interviews that he's done over the decades. So you have to humanize someone without imitating them. Yeah, I think that was, you know, that's... That, I think we're, we're a slightly unusual film in that sense because what we wanted to do was try and create something that's got a feel of theatre to it and theatricality to it rather than trying to go for something that's a sort of a, a, a blueprint copy of, you know, even the mu you know, the closest we get is the music video at the end really to trying to emulate him and the more beady-eyed amongst you or the more... Elton John fanatical amongst you will see that even the, co the costumes are different. They're subtly different from what he wore. And we did that because we wanted to try and be authentically creative with it. The movie is set in a fantasy world. So by the very nature of that, we're not limited by the constraints of, of, of trying to be completely faithful to what Elton wore exactly how Elton looked, frankly exactly how Elton sounded. If that was the most important thing, we'd have found that Elton John sound alike, and I would have mimed. But it's a musical, and we're trying to be authentically creative and authentically expressive with it. And also, it's told through the prism of this incredibly exposing, vulnerable thing of of being in a rehab clinic. And you know, there's not there's not archival footage that I can watch and mimic for that. So I have to I have to I have to bring. I have to try and just bring as much substance that's informed by my own emotional life. So, you know, the vulnerability, I'm using my vulnerability to express Elton's. And I'm using my, you know, I can't play Elton's anger. You pay your life, I can play mine. <laughs> and, you know, and that, that's, what, that's what I do. I, it's, of course, in, in homage and celebration to him, but it's, it's filled with a lot of me. And that is charged by my love and respect and admiration of him if that makes sense and it doesn't sound too absolutely too absolutely it does you know also <clears throat> your your uh the, the vulnerability that you're talking about you are taking on something that is daunting no matter how yeah. much experience as an actor that you might have yeah. so like on, on those moments when when you might have felt maybe it was like long before you started principal photography or maybe it was before you were about to film a a, a key scene or a, a very lavish musical number so when you felt those moments of vulnerability and and feeling so daunted how did you as an actor work through them and get past them to just zero in on the performance I don't know. I think I think you know you're always in service to a script and you're in service to a director, and I I think we're at our best when we are aware that we're a, a component in a you know we're a we're a small component of a big organism that is the production of the film or play or whatever, and actually that I think if you are thinking about it so much that you if you are thinking about it totally about you and 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 your feelings about things to the point of becoming creatively debilitated. I think that's probably not the, the healthiest way to think about it. Of course, nerves are natural, and of course, there are moments of self-doubt, but the, the, I think you have to manage them. I suppose what you're asking me is how I manage them. And yeah. I, I, I mean, I think it helps by working with great other people, you know? Having a support network of people around you who, you know, you can't, n no man is an island, particularly not a lead actor on a film, you know, you, you are, I'm very lucky in that I had two great guys in Jamie Bell and Richard Mann, both regularly texting me and calling me and asking me if I was okay and how it was going and, oh, cool. and being there for you. And of course Dexter and of course Giles Martin, who's the man responsible for the music in the film. But I think it's about not, not shutting yourself off to the support of, of the other people around you. Because if you're working with good people, they'll be, they'll be there for you. you know, also, you know, when you're pre preparing, when you're rehearsing, so, so you think you've got it down, you think you've got the performance down, you know, I know exactly how to play this guy. But I think that's, that's, you should never do that. Okay, really? <laughs> I don't think so, no. All right. Personally, because I feel that to, if you are, if you're rehearsed and prepared and manufactured enough to the point of rigidity, then it'll inherently be dead. You have to, I think you have to step on set and be and be available for anything. Now that still comes with massive amounts of prep, but it's almost that you've got to be you've got to be so prepared that you can just completely dispose of it all, so that when you step on set, because you never know what anyone else is going to do. You can't possibly plan. I don't know what Jamie Bell's going to do. He's an unpredictable lunatic, you know. <laughs> but, but 
that's <laughs> exciting. And I think that's when, you know, that's when you get genuine moments of surprise. So I'm trying to think of an example in the film, but, you know, you never know, you know, I don't know exactly when Richard Madden's going to try and kiss me in the scene. I don't know, you know, I don't know when Jamie Bell's going to decide to take a line and reinterpret it in a completely different way. But provided you're, I don't know if any of you have seen The Irishman yet, but, oh, yeah. um, but like Al Pacino, I think is just about the most f phenomenal example of that possible. It's, you can see that every second of, every second of the performance, neither he nor the people around him know what the fuck he's gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it makes it absolutely electric to yeah, watch. Yeah. I am not comparing myself to Al Pacino, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I, that is absolutely what I would, that is absolutely what I would strive for. And I, I think he is the, is the absolute, master of it. I think his performance in that is extraordinary. I really do. See, now this is interesting to me because you are, as an actor, and, and every, every actor knows to to trust your performance. You, you give yourself, you're vulnerable to your performers, your, your co-stars. And the other thing uh, on top of this is the wardrobe, the makeup, the hair, the prosthetics. So how does all of that elevate you beyond what you yeah, prepared. I mean, completely. You know, I'm the 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 prosthetics were about were quite superficial in that they were more about trying to make me look a little bit older, ten years older than I am, um, or twelve even twelve years older than I. Am. But the first time that we kind of developed that complete look, you know, the that sort of Elton silhouette, which is the sort of slightly beefed out eyebrows, and then the gap in the tooth, and obviously the glasses and the rapidly you know diminishing hair um that really does that, i i love that feeling as an actor i'm far more excited by those things where i feel like I, like it's a departure from me than the things that you know just i suppose it's more interesting to try and move i find it more interesting to try and move away from yourself than than be than just you know use what you got for free which is you know how you normally look um I prefer those character parts, I think. So Lizzie, who did that makeup design, did an incredible job, and she was very collaborative and wonderful. But Julian, I really felt was kind of like, Julian, Julian, was, Julian Day is a costume designer. And I really, really felt that he, I owe, I, owe, I owe a lot of the performance to him because he understood, we've worked together, we made a movie called Robin Hood together a few years ago, and he and I got on very, very well on it. And he is a very, I always say to him that the thing, I mean, you guys will know about this. You know, have ever worked with a costume designer who n never looks above shoulder height and sort of forgets that you're there? And I, I, it's really, it's, I find it really hard because cause so much about, you know, I think a really good costume designers understand that, that, that costume completely conditions performance and sure. quality of movement and, and, fr and, and confidence, frankly. And Julian really, really understands that. The first thing he always asks me is, how do you feel? And, um, you know, every time I, we try and assemble a new look, and, uh, and there's a lot of them in the film, we, we, got, we did many, many tens of hours of fittings. But I always love that about him. How do you feel? Because... It's really important, particularly with this guy, because so much of his psychology is is wrapped up in why he wears these things. Because you know he doesn't. The big thing about Elton is he doesn't feel attractive, and he doesn't feel. He at this stage he didn't feel particularly sexy. I think at moments he's gotten over that, but I think a, a large part of how he did that was by sort of compensating with this extraordinarily um, flamboyant, gregarious stage wear, and. Um, you know, he said that he didn't, he looked at some of his contemporaries like Jagger and Bowie and thought they were beautiful, but he didn't feel that way. And I think to, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but my instinct is that it's that thing where you ridicule, almost ridicule yourself so no one else can. And I think that's where the slightly clownish element of him comes from. Because I felt when researching and reading about him and watching things before we started, I thought there was some, there's something quite, he still does it now, he still, when he has that, he puts that broad smile on and it's quite, it, it's, it's quite, I think it's quite clownish. It feels quite like, it's a, it's a protection I think with him. And that's why in that scene backstage at the Royal Albert Hall, that wasn't, that wasn't scripted, that 
like, smiling in the mirror. That just came out of... There we go. That's a good example. We didn't know that was going to happen. Okay, so it just happened, uh -huh. you know, as we were filming it. And Dexter got very, very hot and bothered and excited. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, it, and it made it into the movie, you know. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I'm returning to an earlier question. But, yeah, I think that's... that's and, and so it was important that... that you, you know, I, 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 was, I was a, a big champion of Julian getting the part because I'd just worked with him and thought he was wonderful and getting the, the job rather. Um, but yeah, he, he really, I really do owe a great debt to him, I think. And also just, you know, I don't know, I don't know how much you guys, I mean, just a few little touches that you may, or you may have seen, but you may not, that, you know, the, the orange neoprene costume, it's, um, it, the, the silhouette is completely Elvis. So it's all informed by his love of this, great performer and one of the few really wonderful kind things that his mother gave, did for him and giving him this, this record, you know. Um, the horns create a heart and the glasses are heart, so it's looking for love through these glasses. Um, small note as well, the earring I wear in, in all of those scenes is Elton John gave me and it's the first ever diamond earring he ever bought. Um, I know he's a sweetheart. Aww. <laughs> and, um, and also as well, um, the, my f my favourite little motif that Julian has in the film is this idea of you know. But if you know Bernie Taupin, he's um, he's obsessed with the Wild West and he lives on a ranch and he's into rodeo and his daughter's a competitive rodeo performer. And, but basically, you know, that first time they meet in the Lancaster Grill, they are these two kids and they bond over you know the idea of his, uh, Reg's name sounding like a cowboy and they sing Streets of Laredo by Marty Robbins. And you look at them in profile, and I love that if you, if, if you then look at the scene where Elton really nearly completely destroys the relationship, um, the camera wraps around and goes back to that profile of the two of them, and they're both dressed as cowboys. So, so Jamie's got this little tassel thing and he's drinking his tea, and Elton's leaning over and he's got that hat on. Um, that, and that costume is all entirely, the, the, bl the blue and red satin tailoring is the blue of Dorothy. The straw hat is for the straw, um, the straw cowboy hat is for the scarecrow. Um, I'm wearing ruby slippers. Uh, my shirt is metallic for the tin man. My earring is green for the Emerald City. And before I leave, I put on a fur coat like the lion. And that's all, yeah, he's fucking clever, you see. <laughs> um, so, um, that's just a, that's the level of depth and and work and consideration that Julian brings to his craft, and it's why he's the best costume designer I've ever worked with. Well, what makes you, you talked about Dexter? You know, uh, what makes Dexter Fletcher a great actor's director? I think he understands people, and he understands what individual actors need to get the best out of them. Dexter is also a massive, overgrown child, <laughs> and he creates an atmosphere of you could be forgiven for thinking that it's not an atmosphere of incredible hard work, because it is, but he creates a lightness and a jollity and an irreverence that makes you feel very playful and makes you feel kind of naughty and kind of, it's a very light atmosphere. And acting is just play, you know, as we know. It's just, yeah, that's what that call and response, making yourself emotionally available thing is. It's just about lightness. It's remembering that when, you know, when you were six and you were pretending there were three other people in the room and your action figures had voices that it's, you know, and you never questioned or doubted it, it's just exactly the same thing. And he ha has a really keen understanding of that, um, an innate understanding of it. And I just find, uh, I feel like I find a, a special freedom in, on his set. What was the most challenging musical scene to film? Um, that underwater singing of Rocket Man was bloody hard. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, it's hard because the t the tank at Pinewood w that we that we filmed it in is about twenty. It's probably uh, it's probably about twice the depth of this room, and so to get to the bottom of it, I've done it a couple of times before this underwater filming thing. For anyone who's seen Kingsman, Matthew Vaughan seems to delight in drowning me. <laughs> but I um, but what I've never done before is have to go is is sort of have to 
act like I'm saying, of course you can't sing underwater, but they do play the music under underwater. Oh, wow. and, and it's one of the only times in the film I'm actually miming because you can't sing underwater. I didn't know you could play music underwater. That blew my mind. Um, <laughs> and anyway, so you, you, you basically go down on air with a team of incredible divers who are some of the best, most professional, incredible people I've ever worked with. And... Um, but the, the thing about it is because you're going, you're going deep enough so that you have to equalise. So when you're down there, you can't just rush to the surface. You've got to come up gradually oh, right. to re-equalise the pressure. Mm -hmm. So what you end up doing is staying down there for like 15, 20 minutes. And they, bring, they take the air away and they bring it back. And it's... Um, that's the first play I ever did. <laughs> you, you wanted me to see that. You saw... Is that Did you know that? Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. Um, uh, basically, you have to go down on air and um, you, they, they take and they bring and take away the, the air from you. But the, the thing that's really difficult about it is when you, um, when you lie down on your back, the water will goes up your nose unless you get there's a certain point where you tip back and the water just rushes up your nose and if that happens you're really screwed because you can't because if you get a lung full of a lung full of water you're going to panic and then you're going to want to go to the surface as quick as possible but you can't do that because you have to equalize to get back up so it's really quite intense and full on and the first at the first hour or two of doing it I really, I, I think, I think, I, I think I felt like because I'd done it before on Kingsman. Um, I think I thought it would, I would be more ready for it, and it, it was, it was silly of me to think that because I think I underestimated it. And the first two hours of it, I kept panicking and coming back to the surface. And it, you have to really sort of, it's almost meditative. You have to kind of go into a slightly different slightly different mode and really calm your breathing down but that's what's really you know and the, the stress of it is is that on a film set as most of you will know I'm sure it's everyone's like this come on let's move 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 and it's a horrible counterintuitive thing to have to think about simultaneously slowing down and calming and also making the day and getting the shots um, but we got through it and after a certain point you you relax and calm down and find that freedom and um, but it's it's an interesting it was an interesting exercise. So so when filming is done, principal photography is done. Did you keep anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um. What did I? Yes, yes, you're right. I did. I kept the um the denim jacket from Tiny awesome. D Dancer because it's cool. Yeah. Um, um, and I yeah, keep, I, I'm gonna. It'll be great festival wear for next summer. <laughs> um, <laughs> Or maybe not, actually. It might look a little bit weird. Um, glasses? Glasses. I don't have any glasses. I really wanted the glasses that I wrote um, your song in. I just thought they were really cool and unusual and characterful. And they're original original pieces as well. They're from the 60s. And um, But what happened was that early in this year, the start of this year, Elton's birthday arrived. And I um, I didn't... It's like what 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 on earth do you get for Elton John for his birthday? You know, it's like, yeah. Jesus. Um, and uh, what I decided to do was I took those glasses. Uh, Paramount, the lovely people at Paramount said I could have them, <laughs> and I um, I had his reading prescription put in them, and I gave them to him for his birthday. So he has them. And in fact, if you watch the recording of "I'm Gonna Love Me Again," which is the credits song. Uh, if you watch the video we're recording, he's he's actually wearing them, and from time to time I go over and I and he's if he's doing a crossword or something he'll be wearing them. Um, it's a lovely, lovely thing. That is very lovely, actually. Yeah, Doesn't yeah, just, I know. You know it's a really heart. <laughs> yeah, it's a sweet thing. I mean, he's been so kind to me and giving me so many incredible gifts. I can't really compete. So I so I, um, <laughs> I thought you know rather rather than try and get something expensive or ostentatious get something that means something and that's why that's why I did that I uh, you know we uh, here at the SAG after foundation we get questions submitted okay on these cards that say SAG after foundation on them mm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this question is from D Beth Damiano Beth are you oh hello Beth yeah. Beth the knitter the knitter has See, the first question well wow. how do you pronounce your surname uh, Damiano. Damiano. Damiano Damiano okay 
So the next question is, what do you wish you knew at the start of your career that you know now? That's a great question. Oh, wow. Um, oh, okay, what do I wish I knew at the start of my career that I know now? I mean, a great many things I wish I knew at the start of my career. And I still feel like I'm learning as well. I'm still young, I hope, you know, 30 <laughs> next week. Um, but I feel like, I suppose that if you count, if you if you think back, if, if, I, if I think about it in terms of before, no, f fuck it actually, <laughs> no. It, so I think when I was at drama school, I think there's there's a trend there's a trend and a, and a tendency to think that if you're not, if you're not as an actor in pain and turmoil, then it, if you're not feeling bad, you know, or when you're depicting something negative, then it's not valid or justified. And I think it's a very, it comes from a very sort of, I think it comes from a good place because it comes from people wanting to feel like they're, that it's really costing them something and, re and they're really, 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 really feeling what the character's feeling. And I think that what you feel as an actor should only ever be, it can only ever be secondary to what an audience is feeling. And you sh and personally, I think there's a, there's a joy and a lightness in expression, even, and a catharsis in expression, even of negative things. So, you know, when I'm, you know, the moments in the film where I'm upset or crying or angry, it's more for me, it feels more like a quality of, of momentum and and um, and charge from what's around me and the scene, than me genuinely having to go. Well, unless I get myself really angry, you know, it's more it's more just that it sort of feels like it kind of happens. It feels more reactive than than me. It doesn't feel like really being angry, not to me anyway. But so I wish if I could go back to myself, I would say don't beat yourself up if you don't feel it every time you do it because you, I don't think you can. I really don't think you can, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessary, but, that, but I would never be prescriptive about that to anybody else because everyone has their own method and it has to be respected. But to myself, I felt like when I learned to cut myself some slack and not worry every time about feeling it, and if I hadn't felt, if I didn't feel terribly kind of in pain all the time, it wasn't valid. I felt when I absolved myself of a responsibility to that, I think my acting improved personally. So that's what I would say to myself, but I would absolutely not say it to anybody else because not everyone agrees. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. All right, last question. Uh, this one is from Patricia War. Oh, wow, there you go. Two front row Hi, questions, Patricia. this is amazing. All right, so uh, her question is, love the film and your performance was four stars. Thank you. She even like, like like actually drew the stars. That's very kind so, of you, nice thank job. you. Nice uh, job. Out of curiosity, why wasn't Someone Save My Life Tonight included? I thought that it it's was- the, It's the one song that I, I, I campaigned for. I really wanted it in the film. And, I, and I, I wanted it in the film because when it's my favorite Elton John song, and it's completely autobiographical. It's Bernie writing about Elton, and he's writing about actually an episode in the film that was, that was, it was cut with, with Elton's ill-fated, um, short-lived um, engagement uh, when they were super young. Uh, and with, that was in the film. It's a little bit of his in the DVD extras, actually, which you can watch if you, if you so wish. Um, but I, I suggested at one point to Dexter that at that moment, at that moment in the rehab, I've never told anyone this either, actually. Um, but I, I suggested that at that moment of arrival in the rehab center where he kind of you know with that with the with the family and he kind of has that reconciliation i wondered if you could have someone save my life tonight or part of it as a sort of interlude into why i'm still standing and and i thought that maybe rather than appearing dressed he could have been dressed by the people around him as he sang it um <laughs> What a great idea! Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, uh, I that if it was my movie, that's what would have happened. But you know, <laughs> but it's not. But you know, I'm not the director. Dexter is, and I couldn't have made this film as well as he did, anywhere near as well. So, you know, it, well, thank you. But I, I um, that's the uh, that, that that I did actually suggest that, and I and it would have been nice. But the 
the bloody problem is that he's not short of excellent songs, Elton John. So, so you know, there's an embarrassment of riches, and there just wasn't time. And it, and actually, it didn't really. Dexter's wisdom there was it doesn't. It would have been nice to have it in, but it's almost a repeated beat. It's almost it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, it could. I think it might have. It might have been nice to have a moment of reflection, but actually, what a, a moment of emotional reflection about you know East End nights and muggy lights, curtains drawn, r- drawn with the living room downstairs. There's something reflective and melancholic about it that I quite liked. I was always trying to push the movie in a more melancholic direction, um, which uh, and Dexter's a, a, a brighter energy, I suppose. But I think we complement each other a little bit in that way. Not that I'm bloody, you know. A dark brooding soul, but I um, but I what happened instead was the first part of I'm Still Standing, which I I w- I wanted to sing some of it in the rehab center, and I, and I did it. We had never done a temp track for that, so I basically improvised that I'm Still Standing section and tried to make it that reflective in a similar way. So he turns around and says to them, I found a taste of love in a simple way, and it's through this process of recovery. So rather than include someone save my life tonight. Instead, I tried to make the first half of I'm Still Standing do something similar. I, I always say, Taryn, that the conversations here at the sag Actra Foundation are always the very best, and this was no exception. I hope you had a great time. I've loved it. Night. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Taryn Edgerton, everybody. Thanks very, very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.